Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Muslims Uncensored, the exclusive show on Five Pillars where we discuss all of the biggest news events happening across the Muslim world. I'm Robert Carter and I'm joined here by uh, the man of mystery, Roshan Sali. Uh, Roshan, you've been... Why man uh, of mystery? Well, you've been away for recently. Yes. Do you want to explain yourself? Because when I went away briefly... Five-star holiday in uh, <laughs> when Dubai. I went, when I went away briefly, I was slammed and humiliated for This it. is uh, revenge, is it? <laughs> it is. Uh, no, no. So it what, was, what would you call this? Uh, an Eid it was. Away, I'm uh, not going to tell you where I went because uh, that's none of your business, quite frankly. <laughs> um, or the viewers. <laughs> but uh, no, it was UK, uh, UK break. Um, very, very kind of uh, lower middle class UK kind of break. <laughs> Um, <laughs> lots Camp of expenses. Side. You know, Camp they say no expenses somewhere. spared. It's the opposite of that. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, no, it was just, I think we were all a bit burnt out after Eid, and you're going to be going on a holiday soon as well. <laughs> it's that uh, war, holiday yeah. war, isn't it? It's like every time someone goes away on the team, we've got to shame and humiliate them. Yeah, we, we just, I think we haven't really uh, taken a break for, you know, since October the 7th, have we? Um, mm. And it's been full on. And obviously Ramadan is full on for us, not mm. just editorially, but fundraising. Alhamdulillah, we had a, you know, uh, we, we had a, a lot of success there, Alhamdulillah. Mm. Um, but um, I just needed a few days off where I didn't think about Five Pillars too much. I hope you Although I did yourself. do a story the day uh, Iran attacked Israel, I did yeah, click back the, into gear. The, the second you went away, we almost started World War Three. Yeah. Like World War Three was kicking we off. We started it. Well, uh, like uh, <laughs> yeah. Iran did or Israel did. Let, we'll discuss that in the yeah. show. But uh, yeah, you went away. World War Three almost died. So how was your Eid? Did you stuff back. your face for a oh, week? Oh yeah, uh, Eid Barak to everyone. Uh, yeah, my Eid was fantastic. I was working for most of it, not on the first day. Uh, I normally you have the day off for Eid, just yeah, so you know. The day just off let viewers know you have the day off. We uh, I worked on Eid. <laughs> we <laughs> we, uh, uh, we we ha we normally celebrate Eid for three days. Yeah. Is that is that a standard thing in my household? We celebrate for about three days at least. Yeah, I mean this year I didn't quite do that, but um, yeah, under normal it's a three day holiday. So yeah, I worked. Uh, I worked most of those three days, but not the first day. You know what I think break. we should do is we should um, have at least a two day Eid in terms of like if it's a school. It was it was during the school holidays uh, this year, so it wasn't an issue. But usually Eid comes bang in the middle of uh, a school term, mm. and it's hard enough getting one day off from these secular schools. Um, but usually most schools give you one day off. But I think we should go for a two-day Eid because often Muslims do celebrate Eid on different days, mm. you know. Um, so I think we should, we should be pushing for a two-day Eid. Yeah, that makes total sense. Turn it into a bank holiday if we just... Uh Apply some. How about a week long <laughs> Eid? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get the whole month off. Just the whole month off, I think. But anyway, let's uh, let's crack on because we've got some really important subjects to discuss. Iran, of course, and its uh, retaliatory attack on Israel, an unprecedented move mm. uh, by Iran. The first time they've ever directly flung missiles at Israel. Uh, th this, of course, was uh, sparked after, after Israel initially attacked their consulate building in Syria, flattening it and killing some of their senior generals. Uh, so basically everyone, World War Three is trending. People are now wondering whether Israel will respond. Uh, Roshan, let me just ask for your uh, reaction following Iran's attack on Israel. Okay, so I'm going to react to some reaction because we've been both following quite closely the pro-Palestine camp's reaction to the Iran attack on Israel. So broadly, there seem to be two extremes. One is the anti-Iran people in the pro-Palestine camp um, are saying this was just fireworks. It was theater, it was choreographed, it was hoodwinking all of us, it was nothing. The pro-Iran camp, um, which would include the, the resistance axis and even groups like Hamas and the Houthis and Hezbollah that are actually doing the fighting, they were saying it was a strategic defeat for Israel, a historic moment, a massive blow to Israel. So those are the two extremes. I find neither of those extremes particularly convincing. Um, and I fall somewhere in the middle. I'm sitting on the fence a little bit. I don't like doing that, but I am. I think that this attack by Iran was clearly a self defense measure after Israel basically killed its senior generals, etc. In that attack on, you know, Damascus a few weeks ago, the, Amer the Iranian embassy or consulate, whatever it was, that is a part of Iranian territory. 
So literally, it was like Israel attacking Iranian territory. So I think Iran concluded there had to be some kind of response uh, in kind. Now, it was clearly choreographed. They basically told the Americans, and they even told the Israelis. They signaled it. Uh, they didn't tell the Israelis or the Americans directly, but indirectly. They signaled that this is going to happen perhaps a week in advance. They choreographed it. They, I think it was, it was said about 78 hours in advance, Iran admitted, we let regional people know, regional yeah. countries know what was happening. 78 hours, that's like a couple of days. Yes. So a couple of days in advance. It was, it was an attack designed to be intercepted. The Iranians knew that most of their missiles, if not all of them, would be shot down. They knew that, and it was in that way a symbolic attack, which was, it was, it was there to send a message to Israel that you have crossed a red line, and therefore we are going to establish a new red line. Um, but yes, so in a way, it was theatre, and it was fireworks in one sense. However, the fact is, Iran has directly attacked Israel from Iranian soil for the first time in the Islamic Republic's history. It sent 300 missiles, most of them drones, but some of them cruise missiles, some of them ballistic missiles, some of them did hit um, Israeli bases. Uh, we don't know how much damage has been done. We think not much has been done, but the fact is that Israel hasn't let you know, reporters into these bases, so maybe there's more damage done than Israel is letting on. Israel has not been able to defend itself on its own. It had to rely on Jordan, which we'll get to, um, and the UK and the US shooting down those Iranian missiles. So this is an historic, unprecedented attack, and Iran has promised a bigger attack should Israel retaliate on Iranian soil. So I don't think we can dismiss this as just theater and fireworks. I think that is basically coming from people who hate Iran because of what Iran did in Syria. Also, there's some sectarianism involved, I'm sure. Um, and I think it's poor analysis as well. I, I think this is a significant attack, but at the same time, it's not the real deal at the moment. It's interesting you say that because obviously Iran uh, talk, talked big, a big game, especially before and after their consulate in Syria was hit by Israel. Talk about revenge, talk about uh, setting new uh, precedents, talking about you know setting red lines again, hitting back hard. Iran obviously has been hit by Israel, not just this time, but many, many times in the mm. past as well. Their top guys getting taken out in Syria again and again and again. And the so-called retaliation doesn't really come back in, in the same level. So, for example, Iran fired like 300 projectiles at Israel, bigger than what Israel fired at them to hit the consular building. But there were no casualties, no. as far as we know, no Israeli casualties. So it wasn't a blood for blood, eye for an eye revenge. Yeah. So I think what critics of Iran would say, even in the Muslim world, is, well, it was a damp squid. It was, it was, uh, it, it's not a proper retaliation. It shouldn't really be celebrated as a victory as the way it's been spun yeah. by Iran. In fact, actually, the, the UK has basically said that it was a massive defeat because Israel was so successful in defending itself mm. and that the Iranian attack was ultimately useless, that they're basically advising Israel, look, just take this as a win mm. because the Iranian attack was, in their words, useless. It was rubbish. It was a failure. It, it, I think what, if you, it's disputed, but Israel claims that 99% of all projectiles didn't hit, uh, like 1% of 300, that's like what, three, three projectiles hitting? It's disputed, we don't know, Iran would- I mean, would I wouldn't take more. Israel are uh, liars, they've lied so many times that I wouldn't take anything they, they say at face value, but at the same time, there's no proof that there were casualties. As you say, I would say it wasn't a like-for-like -like attack because Israel actually killed some of their generals, mm. uh, whereas they didn't actually kill any, you know, soldiers, Israeli soldiers or whatever. So I would say it was a lesser attack in many ways. Mm. And I just wonder because obviously, you know, Iran's reputation is on stake because they're obviously trying to portray themselves as the one who mm. steps up for Palestine, who does more than their regional uh, counterparts do in stepping up for Palestine. But if you think about it from an objective position, how, how, how intimidating was this attack for Israel? You know, the, the, it, it suggests... It was a warning the, shot. You think it was just a warning shot? Well, it, at, at this point, it's a warning shot. I mean, this ain't over yet. We don't know what's mm -hmm. going to happen. Israel will we'll get onto this, but Israel may respond. And if Israel responds, Iran has pl pledged a more deadly attack. 
a bigger attack. That's what they say. So um, it, it's 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 a first shot, uh, perhaps. I mean, historically, we might look back at this and say this was the first shot in a wider war, or we could say done and dusted. Mm. I don't know which way it's going to go. Because when you said earlier that you don't believe the extreme anti-Iran position, that this was all theatre, this was all mm. fireworks, in a way, it sort of is, isn't it? It, it, it could be you're saying considered it's, that you're, if you're it's saying over. It's choreographed. You're saying it no, was no, it, choreographed. They let everyone know what was happening. Yeah. We saw it in lifetime slowly yeah. heading over to Israel. Israel was well prepared. So in a way, it sounds like it was there. Um, it, it, I think we don't know the answer to that question yet. If, it, with the benefit of hindsight, it, it's proven that this was just, oh, it's over now. Israel doesn't respond. It's over then we could say it was theatre. Yeah, we could, we could make that claim. But if this is part of a wider war, which could well happen, and I don't know which way it's going to go, then it's, it's the first shot in a wider war, mm. uh, and not just theatre. I, I think we have to wait and kind of, you know, make these conclusions in the weeks to come. Mm. I just think, uh, the, 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 obviously, I think we have a responsibility as journalists, yeah. some lookers at Five Pillars, to uh, push the facts and not get bogged down by the extreme sides of either argument. No. Um, and try to be as fair as possible. I think that's, that's what we're trying job. to do. Is, is we're but, not. We're not. Um, what, so what I would say in response is that you know, where Iran has achieved some kind of PR win here or a tactical victory, is that it the amount of money it cost for Israel to be defended mm -hmm. in the short space of time. I think within the space of about four hours, over $1.3 billion was spent yeah. on its uh, Iron Dome defense and or everything else that was involved, the aircraft that were flying to defend it as well. Uh, I mean, how could Israel defend itself in a full total war scenario with Iran and all of its regional assets attacking yeah. at the same time, firing everything, when it costs that much money to defend Israel in a limited, restrained attack by Iran for a short space of time, I have no idea how that would be sustainable. Which cost, um, which cost Iran probably a couple of million to fire those drones <laughs> exactly, and cruise yeah. missiles. But exactly. So a couple of million versus 1.3 billion. Plus Iran. Uh, also, I've heard some military anal analysts say that Iran is now able to kind of map um, the Israeli defenses, air defense is better for a next attack. No, Israel's a small country and uh, it's got you know relatively small population compared to Iran's or whatever. I don't think Iran should be um, too scared about war and I don't think um, Iran can avoid a war as well. I think Iran's strategy since the 1980s when it had that devastating war with I Iraq which really kind of wrecked the country but solidified the, the Islamic Republic uh, on the other hand. Um, it, it, that war was so painful that they've sought to avoid a direct war uh, and they've used proxies like Hezbollah, Hamas and you know, others uh, to do their bidding. That's always been their strategy. But I don't think they can avoid a war with Israel long term. I think Israel will attack Iran at some point, either to stop their nuclear program um, or for other reasons. They are going to attack Iran. And I think Iran should, should I personally think Iran should prepare its population for war. Um, and I don't think they should be scared about that war because war will, will, will entail a lot of pain. Pain. There's no doubt about that. Um, but Iran will survive. The Islamic Republic in Iran will survive as well, I'm sure. Um, a lot of people probably will die. But, I mean, I don't think that's avoidable. I think I I Israel in desperation at some point is going to attack Iran and Iran cannot avoid it. And if they th think they can avoid it, they're probably kidding themselves. We're obviously going to discuss this more. I want to come to the UK and bring a, a different angle from a UK perspective because a lot's been happening here. Britain directly intervened to help protect Israel. I believe they used some aircraft to yeah. down some of the projectiles over Iraq and elsewhere. So they played a role in directly defending Israel. Uh, David Cameron, the British Foreign Secretary, was uh, challenged uh, about uh, Britain's condemnation of Iran. So the UK has slammed Iran for having the audacity to respond after being attacked without bringing the context as to why Iran hit Israel. Uh, we'll play out a very small clip sure. of a Sky News interview where David Cameron struggled to, uh, to, to deal with the hypocrisy yeah. that was being exposed there. Let's just play that out now and see how, uh, how he handled it. What would Britain do if a hostile nation flattened one of our consulates? Well, we would take, uh, we, you know, we would take the very strong action. And Iran would say that that's what they did? Well, what they did, as I said, was a so massive they, attack. So they, they were, were right think, to respond, but they overreacted, is well, that what you're I, saying? I, what I'm saying they is that the, right atta the, attack, the attack they carried out 
was on a very large scale, much bigger than but people they have accepted. they a right to respond? Well, countries have a right to respond when they feel they've suffered uh, an aggression. Of course they do. But look at the scale of that response. Had those weapons not so been shot right down, respond, but there, just could have been, there could have been thousands of casualties, including civilian casualties. I think that's a really important point to take into account. That uh, let me talk to you about your role. So obviously he was <laughs> left a bit red-faced there, Kay Burley, Sky News presenter, doing a good job she challenging him there. Uh, I'll very quickly play out uh, George Galloway, a okay. uh, talk he did in Parliament. He challenged the Prime Minister directly on this and basically said... Was the Prime Minister there when he was said it? The Prime Minister was there. OK. Because usually, usually George Galloway is speaking in an empty, <laughs> empty uh, auditorium, was not he? gone home. But no, on this occasion, <laughs> yeah. he stood up in front of the House and challenged the Prime Minister to his face, who was forced to respond, and he basically called him out on this issue of right. condemning Iran, but not condemning Israel when Israel basically sure. started this uh, tit-for-tat escalation. So let's give Galloway his chance. There was not one single word in the Prime Minister's statement of condemnation of the Israeli destruction of the Iranian consulate in Damascus, which is the proximate reason for the event everyone is here in concert condemning. He was not even asked to do so by the front bench opposite. Kay Burley is the only person so far to demand that of a government minister. We have no treaty with Israel, at least not one that Parliament has been shown. And the Iranians are not likely to listen to him when Britain occupied Iran, looted its wealth and overthrew its one democratic socialist government in my own lifetime. <laughs> well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, what, whatever may have happened uh, a few weeks ago, it is absolutely no justification for launching more than 300 drones and missiles from one sovereign state towards Israel. It's as simple as that. And in the Honourable Gentleman's question, not once did he condemn that action or indeed the actions of Hamas in the region. So that was George Galloway uh, challenging the Prime Minister, who again didn't uh, necessarily address the, the point that uh, it's, oh, it's one rule for one, another rule mm. for another. Iran apparently has no right to defend itself. Israel has every right to defend itself, even when killing kids in Gaza. Uh, this is the lead up to the next question, which is, Will Israel respond? Will Israel respond? And yeah. how bad do you think things are going to get now? People are talking about World War III. The way I see it is that Israel seems to have this uh, ability to drag the West towards World War III whenever it feels mm. like it. And right now, Israel is hell-bent on expanding this into a regional war, it seems to me. Netanyahu wants to stay in power as long as possible. If a regional war happens, he'll be head of the, the war government, even more so in Tel Aviv. So it seems as if he is the type of individual who doesn't like to allow his enemies the last yeah. shot. He likes to keep shooting until his time is up. So what do you think, Roshan? Are we witnessing the start of World War III, or is this going to be some kind of de-escalation that's happening with pressure on Tel Aviv to stop starting a war with the entire region. How do you, how do you see it going forward? Just a quick word on the UK's response. I mean, Kay Burley, you know, kind of did him up a kipper there, didn't he, David Cameron? Um, obviously, if, if the, the UK, you know, were hit, embassy would hit, they would, they would respond very strongly. And they're denying that right to Iran. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And yeah, I mean, the, the UK's role in this has been disgusting right from the beginning, and now they're protecting Israel. They're literally, you know, protect, they're Israel's protectors. Will Israel respond? It's, it's a difficult question. Um, I, I don't know. I think that they're deliberating. They're not sure themselves, because I think the West doesn't want a wider war, because they know that Iran can hit Israel, despite all the pain that, that Iran will suffer, no doubt about that. They can also hit Israel really hard missiles raining down on Tel Aviv and other cities, civilian areas. Even Hezbollah's actions in the north have basically forced Israelis to flee the north of the country. Mm. And they haven't returned home for six, seven months now. So, um, you know, Israel can be hit really hard and damaged really hard. 
Iran's a massive country with a big population. It will recover. Will Israel recover from perhaps an existential war? Iran can also shut down international trade, um, you know, in the, in the Gulf region. And that would literally perhaps destroy the world economy. You know, we're coming up to elections in the UK and the US. You know, neither Biden or Sunak want a world recession, you know, leading up to re-election. So I think the West clearly doesn't want a wider war. They're urging restraint on Israel. Israel, on the other hand, has its fanatical war cabinet, which is led by fanatic um, Netanyahu, but is actually staffed by even worse fanatics uh, in his cabinet, the, the religious right, you know, who believe in killing Palestinians and, and Muslims. And um, they seem to be driving this agenda. They will want immediate retaliation. But I think Biden can restrain Israel uh, if he wants to. Older viewers will, will, will know that during the first Gulf War, when Saddam Hussein hit Israel, the US prevailed on Israel not to respond. And what the, what the UK and, and the US are telling Israel is, no, forget about Iran. Let, leave that for another day. Focus on Gaza. So basically, focus on killing more Palestinians, because we know that focus on Gaza and focus on Hamas is code for killing more Palestinians. So you can see how evil these people are. But um, I don't know whether to resp respond. I, I really don't. I, my, my suspicion is that Iran, that Israel will decide to respond at a later date, possibly through Syria again, uh, assassinations rather than a direct attack on Iranian territory. But I tell you what, if they do decide to attack Iran directly, then all bets are off because then the ball is, I mean, the, the ball is, is now in the Israeli court, you know, because Iran has said, we're not going to escalate. If you don't do anything, we're not going to escalate. But if you escalate, we will escalate more. So, yes, if Israel hits Iran, then all that bluster about World War Three could happen, could happen. What do you make about the fact that uh, it wasn't just the UK and US that was defending Israel from uh, the Iranian attack? There were also uh, Arab countries that are being slammed for defending Israel. Uh, Jordan definitely Israel. intervened, uh, and I think it opened its airspace to American and UK and Israeli fighters to shoot down those drones. Uh, that's the very least it did. King Abdullah was a traitor. You know, his grandfather was a traitor. You know, they, 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 they rebelled against the Ottomans, right? And they were British agents. And even Jordan was created basically by the British as a buffer state between Israel and, you know, the, the Arab world. Um, you know, but uh, they're traitors. They're simple as that. And they would, they would side with Israel and the West every day of the week over Muslims. You know, if, if the Kaaba got attacked by Israel, they would support Israel. That's what, that's what that, that, this is King Abdullah. You know, this is King Abdullah. This is the Jordanian monarchy. They are absolute traitors to the Ummah. Um, but Jordan is pro-Palestine because its population is majority Palestinian. A lot of refugees, descendants of refugees. So I think we should keep an eye on Jordan because that we know that there have been lots of protests outside the Israeli embassy in Jordan. Uh, we should keep an eye. I think, I think uh, King Abdullah should, uh, should fear for his throne. Yes, uh, I must admit that uh, there is a lot of pressure on him right now. Uh, your comment of him being referred to as a traitor is, is widespread in the Muslim world right now, uh, including the Arab world too. I wonder if uh, he, his uh, government, whatever you want to call it, his foreign minister, for example, mm. said that regardless of who was firing over Jordan, they would have taken it down. So he actually claimed that um, even if Israel had been firing rockets over the Jordanian territory, yeah. they would have shot that down. Let's see if that happens. What do you, what do you, do you, so you, <laughs> that's your response? Uh, you don't believe a word that they're saying? Um, I think if Israel, I mean, Israel will probably, it'll be interesting to see if they do fire at Iran over whose airspace they will fly, or will they, I mean, the, the UK and the US have already said that they won't participate in that attack, so you won't be seeing missiles launched from Qatar or the, you know, the US, UK air bases in the region. So it'll be interesting to see over, you know, it'll probably be kept a secret or they'll deny, it'll probably will go over Jordanian airspace or, I don't know, it, I wouldn't be surprised if it went over Saudi Arabian airspace, but they'll just deny it. Look, you know, the, the Arab regimes are traitor regimes, and the, the Saudi regime is a traitor regime. They, they would side with Israel and the West any day over the Muslims. Obviously, they live in the Muslim world, and they have to appease their local populations to a certain extent. So they will, you know, if, if they had a free hand, they, they, would, they would side with Israel every day of the week. Their, their, their affinity is more with Israel in the way they think, and with the West. So these people, we should have no hope in them whatsoever. I mean, 
I don't know. I mean, I guess 10 years ago or more than that, I would have said they, they need to be overthrown. Um, but the Arab Spring, we know that that can lead to absolute disaster as well. So I don't know what the answer is. But all I know is that these people are traitors and um, they, they're pro-Israel. You know, MBS is pro-Israel. He would have signed that agreement. He would do so again today if it was palatable for him to do so. Mm -hmm. That he wouldn't, he didn't, he didn't fear his domestic population or whatever, or, or the regional equation. But um, yeah, absolute traitors. What more can I say? Yeah, there's no doubt that Iran is uh, very active in supporting Palestine right now in comparison to what other countries in the region are doing. In fact, a lot of them are, are basically doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, uh, Iran is doing something. But do, do you think that this escalation will lead to a de-escalation? Do you think that this will have benefit for Gaza, this exchange? Because obviously the way I see it, Iran was defending itself. Yeah. This particular attack on Israel shouldn't be portrayed as an attack for Palestine because obviously Iran's attack came as an act of self-defense. That's yeah. what they call it. They're not, they didn't just attack because Israel's doing the genocide. But some would argue that, well, it's now put Israel under so much pressure that actually it was kind of for Gaza's benefit as well because it could lead to a de-escalation. It could force Israel not to go into Rafah uh, and uh, could ultimately lead them to totally lose all their military objectives of defeating Hamas. This could be the step in that direction. So how would you, how would you sum up the attack in terms it's of... Difficult question. I mean, I mean the, when I said earlier that Iran shouldn't fear war with Israel, let's not forget Israel can't even defeat Hamas. Six, mm. seven months into this, they haven't even been able to defeat Hamas, which is a, you know, basically a ragtag army compared to, you know, a militia compared to what Iran's got, um, and you know, in a very small confined space as well. Mm. Um, I personally think that Israel might even focus more if they don't decide to attack Iran. They might focus more on Gaza. I think all options are bad, basically, but they're bad for Israel as well. I don't think I don't think ultimately a regional war, if Palestine is going to be liberated, I think a war has to happen at some point, like a massive one. A regional war, um, because what's the other what's the other option? Uh, the other option is that they come to some kind of deal, but that deal will happen at the expense of the Palestinians. So that will mean that Israel wins. So if 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 Palestine is going to be liberated at some point and become free then I think there probably has to be an existential war at some point in the future. I'm not saying it's going to happen now, but I think it, it has to happen. Otherwise, the Israelis will win uh, because they're not going to give up that, you know, they're not going to free Palestine you know, out of the goodness of their hearts. And they will get desperate as well. And they, they you know, at, at some point in the future, maybe when the oil age finishes and, you know, the West abandons them to a certain extent, they still have all those weapons. They're probably going to use them. This is a genocidal state. It's a genocidal state that is willing to, you know, kind of, it would use a nuclear weapon on its neighbors. It would, it would. Yeah, and I think that uh, we now seriously need to start asking ourselves this question, us Westerners, uh, non-Muslim Westerners I'm referring to, is that, you know, how far are we going to allow Israel to drag us into a situation which is going to cause nothing but misery for the world, for the world economy, for us here in the West? I mean, Westerners might not care about genocide in Gaza, quite frankly. Yeah. But a lot of them don't. But they care about petrol prices. They care about petrol prices. They care about their own, uh, yeah, like their own economy here. Food prices. So yeah. seriously, they need to start asking this question because Israel doesn't have the West's best interests at heart. I don't think, and I think that the evidence is there now. They're only interested in, in pursuing their colonialist project. They want they yeah. want to expand territory. They want to kill Palestinians. They want to steal more land, yeah. and they want to. They, and that's for their benefit, their little colonialist agenda benefit. Is it within Britain's uh, geopolitical interests? I don't even think that it's in uh, the UK's national security I don't think it is. interests anymore. So if we're going to argue from their perspective, non-Muslims in this country need to wake up and ask themselves this, this question: Are you willing to? to fight World War III on behalf of Israel just so they can keep their little uh, yeah. colonization. Now, now that area is becoming less strategic, I mean, obviously it was the center of the world because of oil and gas, and it still has plenty of that, but it is running out. And now, you know, the West is pivoting more towards China as being the big threat. I think that that region is losing its strategic value for the West. Um, so all that remains is maybe ideological affinities. But how far can that take you? That surely can't take you into a war where you risk the welfare of your own people and your blood and treasure. So I think you're right. I think the West has to kind of decouple from this genocidal, um, fanatical, apartheid state. 
um, which is pursuing its own selfish agenda and dragging the West into all its troubles. And, and the West should, you know, every nation state operates on the basis of self-interest to, to one extent or the other. And the West isn't operating on self-interest. You know, obviously, the, the Israel now is playing up the Islamic threat and, oh, we, we're holding back the Islamic tide, the extremist tide, and they're, they're playing on these Western sensibilities. But it's just all bluster and propaganda, you know, and uh, the West has a difficult decision to make. Do you really want to um, hitch your future prospects in terms of blood and treasure to this little racist, genocidal, pathetic cancer in the heart of the Med Middle East? Absolutely. Obviously, there's going to be so much more coming out of what's happening in the Middle East, I'm sure, so we'll be discussing it. I'm literally watching the news live to see if there's some kind of breaking news attack that's going to take place, an escalation of some kind. So let's see how it goes. But something else big has happened over the past couple of days. Uh, knife attacks in Sydney. There's mm. a, a knife attack crisis, it seems, in, in Australia at the moment. Uh, two major attacks have happened over the past few days. We'll talk about the first one, which happened on uh, the 13th of April. 40-year-old uh, went around stabbing people at uh, a shopping mall, I think it was. And uh, basically, a bunch of people got killed, uh, six people killed, including um, uh, there was a, a pregnant woman who was killed. I think an infant child was also injured in the attack. It was horrific, absolutely mm. horrific. Uh, but everyone started to run with the idea that this must be an Islamist terrorist attack. And not just the normal Twitter trolls that were pushing this fake news, but actually some pretty high profile media personalities were also engaging in what turned yeah. out to be fake news. About a day later, uh, it was revealed by local police that the attacker, this disgusting uh, individual, was a 40-year-old white guy called Joel Korchi, who had no links to Islam or to the Muslim community right. at all. So everyone who peddled this Islamist terrorism story was proven wrong, humiliated and embarrassed as a result of that. But uh, two prominent examples here in the UK who engaged in this fake news uh, agenda bandwagon was Julia Hartley Brewer of Talk TV. Farley Growl, Lala. Yeah, exactly. As we know, she's known here on Five Pillars. And uh, Rachel Riley, a Channel 4 uh, TV personality who is famously very, very pro Israel, a Zionist. She's a Zionist, Zionist. absolute Zionist. Yeah. Outright Zionist. A dopey uh, Zionist as well. She's yeah. thick as two short planks. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, both of them peddled this uh, conspiracy theory, basically, that it was uh, an Islamist and it wasn't. Uh, neither of them has properly apologized for it. Rachel Riley did delete her tweet, uh, but basically said, sorry if you But we screenshotted it, it first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, Julia Hartley Brewer just issued a clarification. Can you just, from now on, can you just say Fartley Growler as a Fartley matter of Growler. course? So Julia Fartley Growler, yeah. uh, she, she again didn't apologize. She, she basically tweeted, look, uh, the, the past tweet was wrong but I didn't update it sooner because I was in the sun enjoying myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's basically her response to it. But these uh, tweets were viewed by millions and millions of yeah. people around the world. And it, it was a disgusting attack, which made everyone angry. And if you go around saying, oh, it's an, it's an Islamist, I mean, every Muslim in the world gets called an Islamist at some point in their life. Do you know what I mean? If not more. Yeah. Uh, so obviously everyone would have been going for Muslims. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it totally disgraceful display there. Uh, just give me your reaction to it, Roshan. I mean, Rachel Riley was basically linking it to global intifada and, the you know, Palestine and Palestinians. Movement. Yeah, Palestinians and their supporters, That's basically right. blaming them yeah. for uh, this uh, knife attack. And uh, Rachel Riley is, I know she's good at maths, you know, a countdown. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, she is genuinely thick as two short plants. I've seen many interviews with her or a few of them. And they're laughable. She doesn't actually understand politics or she's got to stay in her lane, which is basically adding and subtracting and multiplying. Putting the letters on a board. Yeah, putting letters on a board yeah. and just, you know, wearing revealing clothes. And that's, <laughs> I mean, just, a, you know, I mean, I wouldn't call her a bimbo, but some people <laughs> might, you know. And um, yeah, so it's kind of. She's, she's, she's just thick and she's genuinely, you know, she's genuinely not an intelligent person apart from being good at maths. Um, and yeah, it's pure incitement. And I think Channel 4 said that they had reminded her of her responsibilities. That was their response. I mean, obviously, we know very well if a Muslim had done that and they called out Zionists for something they didn't do, they'd be sacked straight away. And so would many others. But you know, obviously these Zionists, they seem to have uh, impunity mm -hmm. when it comes to the mainstream uh, establishment. 
So, yeah, she got off scot-free. Julia Fartley Growler couldn't care less, and Talk TV probably give her a promotion for that, you know? Mm. And it, nothing will happen to these people. I mean, I do think we need to complain and put pressure on Channel 4. Talk TV obviously won't listen to us because they're Islamophobes. But, yeah, they can say whatever they want, and they'll get away with it, and they can incite against Muslims. We're second-class citizens in this country. No one really cares about our welfare. Yeah. Um, and no one really cares about our protection. And, um, you know, it will, it will li literally, the only time they might start caring a little bit is if we're killed, you know. But mm. as far as mainstream personalities like this who should be sacked, Julia Fartley Growler should be sacked for that incitement. Rachel Riley should be sacked. She should have no platform on the mainstream whatsoever after that blatant incitement. Mm. But nothing whatsoever will happen to these people because we are second class citizens in this country. And it's about time that we woke up to that fact and organized our own community and we shouldn't expect anything of these people. Yeah, it was gutter level journalism uh, from people who are looked to in the mainstream as like credible people to go to for information and opinion. But really gutter level journalism, total disgrace. I mean, uh, Julia Fartley Growler, uh, literally I'm reading her tweet here. She said on the day that this was another terror attack by another Islamist terrorist. And the fact is, when an attack like this happens, no one knows what's going on. No. no one does. I know people tweet about it and they yeah. give you all these breaking news. A lot of the time it turns out there was fake news later on. We've seen this. We've, we've had to handle it. We're actually journalists yeah. that do a good job. Do you know what I mean, in my opinion? And we actually cover these stories properly and professionally. People go, we could go around saying, oh, the guy looks... The guy looks like an Israeli every single time there was. And we a get, we get, attack. we get, we get uh, viral retweets, don't that? Yeah, we would get viral retweets. We yeah. should just every, imagine if we just went around saying every single attack on the globe. Yeah. he looks Israeli to me. The guy must be Israeli. Speculation is he's Israeli, and yeah. then you know. But the fact is, we would get slammed for you know shaming the industry. We get but banned the, as well. We'd if get we get banned that. as well, yeah. you know, yeah. and uh, held to account. But these mainstream Western journals uh, peddle these Islamophobic conspiracies, and they don't get held to account at all, it seems. So I think that, you know, let's just remind everyone who supports our work, people in the Muslim community, let's not go down to that low, despicable level that they uh, yeah. sink to all the time. Whenever an attack like this happens, let's not peddle fake news. Let's wait no. for the authorities to release just the wait. fact and react to it then. And that brings me towards the second stabbing that happened. A bishop, a Christian bishop, mm. was stabbed uh, recently as well in a church in Sydney. Uh, that was actually recorded during a live stream. Right. So we actually witnessed the, the stabbing take place. And again, we don't actually know who uh, the attack, his origin or his religion or anything like that. Again, people are, haven't learned lessons. They're peddling that this guy must be Muslim or this must be a, a terrorist, yeah. uh, an Islamist terrorist attack. All the police have said at the time of this recording is that they're treating it as a possible terror attack. And we're going to wait and see how it comes out. But people again are saying, oh, the guy looks Jewish, the guy looks Muslim, the guy looks Israeli, the guy looks like an Islamist Arab. And no just one Just wait to see what anything. happens. So I think I just wanted to say this uh, as just professional advice to anyone watching. Just, just grow up, you know, let the authorities deal with it, react once we know the facts. Let's not all just peddle... BS talking points online just to score political uh, yeah. talking points. I mean, there are people in who support Palestine online, some major non-Muslim personalities who tweet about Palestine, and they just keep tweeting, oh, the guy looks Jewish, the guy looks Israeli, the guy looks Jewish. And I'm just like, can you just grow up? That doesn't make the Palestine movement look I think I think there's a wider point stupid. to be made about social media. There are some uh, people on social media, including Muslims, unfortunately, who are literally there to get as many retweets as possible yeah. and views as possible. And they will go to any lengths to do that. Yeah. And th they're not serious people, brothers and sisters. No. They're, not, they're not serious people. Um, they might have millions of followers, but they're not serious people. And don't take your information from them. Yeah. Take it from people who act with some level of responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the good thing about Five Pillars. Sorry to keep uh, self-promoting, but I think it's, it, this is a valid point. You know, we, we are regulated by impress. Uh, we're, we're also professional journalists. I mean, you've been a, you're a veteran as far as I'm concerned in the industry. Dilly as well as, as studied journalism. I mean, I'm, I go on the streets out reporting and yeah. I get involved, I interview people, I learn things before talking about it. You know, so, and I've got a lot of firsthand experience of how to, I've learned through trial and error how to be a journalist. So, you know, get your information from the right place. Follow five pillars and don't follow all of these uh, 
social media personalities who are big online but have no street presence. No. We don't know where they no, were educated. No, that's the other thing. They're, they're, not, they're, they're, they're literally on their, in their armchairs. Yeah. Um, armchair uh, commentators. Armchair commentators. Self-described journalists. Never been on the ground anywhere. No, you never see them at events. You, no one's ever spoken to them before. They've never appeared on TV. And they don't have um, any contacts either. They don't yeah. have any contacts on the ground. They're literally just looking at stuff on Twitter and retweeting it, repackaging it. That's all. Yeah, not, so not serious people. That's my advice to our dear audience and uh, subscribers is, you know, uh, platform us, follow us and wait for the right information to come out before reacting to it. Because, again, you can be caught out saying something stupid uh, and then people ask you, well, uh, where did you get that information from? And it's from some... But on this on um, Sydney Bishop attack, you do see people like, uh, you know, Calvin Robinson, Father Calvin Robinson. I don't think he's a proper father, but anyway, you know, the, the Christian priest um, fanatic. He's basically, they're using this to call for the, um, you know, the expulsion of Muslims from the West. That's literally what they're doing. Wow. Well, there you go. Now, uh, there is a breaking news story which we're going to discuss on the show. It's, mm. again, bringing us back to the UK. Uh, a school, Michaela School, which has been described as uh, Britain's strictest school, has won a legal case, a high court challenge against it by a Muslim student at the school who is challenging it on a uh, ritual prayer ban. Uh, the school has actually won. So that means that basically their secular status yeah. and their decision to outlaw uh, acts of worship, including Muslim prayers on school property, has basically been upheld, as far as I understand it. Roshan, you know about this story quite well, so perhaps yeah. you could uh, contextualize it and then also react to it. Yes, okay, so I can't say too much because I haven't read the judgment. This has just happened before we went on to air. Yeah. I had a quick read of a few articles, that's all I've done. So it looks like a, dis a disappointing result. Uh, this school is um, you know, an ideological school. They're ideologically against um, diversity, I would say. And they want, you know, they, they think that, or the head teacher believes that religious expression should not be allowed in the school um, and will not make allowances for that. So she's, you know, basically effectively banned people from praying. So they're against religious diversity, basically. Yeah, but that's... effectively it targets Muslims you know, because the half the school is Muslim. Yeah. So it affects Muslims more than anybody else. And they're the ones that want to express themselves. Not, not in a kind of, uh, you know, intrusive way, but they want to be able to pray, you know, as simple as that. They want uh, a space, time. space in the school maybe to pray yeah. and uh, allowance to go and pray maybe yeah, during lessons. Yeah, which can be done in a very unobtrusive way without creating a big deal and it's not going to impinge on anyone's freedom whatsoever. It, it's perfectly possible. Many schools in the country allow this. Uh, but that this head teacher is uh, an ideological, she's a secular fa fanatic. I would say she's a, a secular fundamentalist. So she has an ideological issue with that. She believes that it will lead to, you know, the breakdown of the school environment, uh, et cetera, et cetera, learning. Uh, all this, these bogus arguments, which are complete rubbish uh, in my view. Anyway, so it look, this school is clearly a school that does not respect religious diversity. My advice to the parents would be to remove their children from that school. Now, I think that it's a high-performing school in terms of grades, so I think that a lot of Muslim pupils or parents will not do that. But I think if they have self-respect and they respect their religion um, and they have religious red lines, they should simply withdraw their pupils from this. This is not a school for you, brothers and sisters. This is not a school that respects your children's religious freedom. Simple as that, and it never will be, so withdraw. That would be my, my, and more generally, I think Muslims, especially at primary school age, they should homeschool um, because there are too many schools in this country that do not respect Muslims and their right, which is enshrined, I would say, uh, in you know, education and law to express their religious identity. Now, alhamdulillah, a lot of schools do, and they're, f they're fine, but the schools that don't, that are run by these ideological fundamentalists, um, head teachers in particular, I think you know Muslims should withdraw their pupil, their, their children. They should homeschool them. That's quite possible, uh, especially at a young age. Often they will learn much more as long as the parents are committed uh, to to homeschooling. Mm. Uh, and it's possible because the subjects aren't so specialized in secondary school. They're more specialized. So at, at that primary age, I would encourage Muslims to set up homeschooling groups. Um, it won't be possible for every Muslim family because the West is so expensive, living here is so expensive that you often need two people to work, two parents to work. But if you have that option, definitely look into homeschooling and if you believe in your deen 
and you believe in your children's right to pray, it's, you know, when it's prayer time, remove your children from schools like Michaela. I think uh, one thing I'll say is that I think it reinforces this uh, idea that this is just not a Christian country because this uh, ruling was against, uh, it's a prayer ban. Uh, I believe from the school's perspective, it would be against uh, all religion. So any mm. religious practice in the school is, is frowned upon, basically. But Hindus don't want to pray at school, nor the Christians. Exactly. So what I would say is that this is the latest proof that this country is no longer a Christian country because we're bombarded on GB News, we're bombarded on uh, social media that this is a Christian country. How dare you Muslims come over here and peddle your religious beliefs? How dare you take over our churches and uh, turn them into mosques and all that type of stuff? But to all those people that keep pushing that on us, onto Muslims, just shut your mouth. This is not a Christian country anymore. Mm. Now, the fact that it was a Muslim student who actually tried to step up and uh, defend religious rights in that school in this Christian country again, just emphasizes the fact that just stop calling Britain a Christian country. I don't want to hear it anymore. It's not a Christian country. You don't even defend your own faith in schools like this. It, it comes to Muslims to defend uh, uh, the right to, to practice a faith. Okay, the student wasn't successful this time, but the fact is the only religion worth any level of respect from a religious perspective is Islam in this country because it's the only one that steps up for the, re the rights of religious people in this yeah. country. And I'm not just talking about Muslims. I mean, when we see LGBT uh, rainbow mafia indoctrination attempts in public schools as well, it's not Christians, not Christian parents that are coming out and protesting this in large numbers. It's Muslims that are spearheading that campaign. And this is happening across the Western world. Any issue where religious rights mm. are infringed upon in the West, it is the Muslim community that steps up the Muslim community, and then of course you'll get a couple of Christians, even some religious Jews tagging along on those protests, but it is Muslims that is defending the rights of faith, the Abrahamic faiths in the West, mm. that needs to be respected, that needs to be acknowledged, we should take pride in that as Muslims, because if it wasn't for Islam in the West, I think religion as a whole, the, the belief in one God, would be basically defeated in the West. Mm. I, just, I just think that's a really interesting fact that doesn't get credit. Stop calling this a Christian country. Stop yeah. rubbing that claim in our face. I don't want to hear it. It's not a Christian country. Christianity is a defeated force, has failed here. It's not stepping up for itself. It's a compromised religion. Just step aside, let Muslims So uh, what you're do what you're saying, it's an interesting point they make. What you're saying is basically, if you're a Christian, you should actually be supporting Muslims because- Absolutely, absolutely. If you value your freedoms to practice your faith at all, outside of the home, mm. then back Islam back Islam in Britain. Because Christian, most Christians would be against Muslims, I guess. Like, let, okay, let me just uh, give a, 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 the most radical scenario here. Let's say that Islamic rule was established in Britain. Do you know what would also Inshallah. be established? Do you know what would also be established? The rights of Christians. <laughs> the rights of Christians. <laughs> uh, I won't comment on that right now. <laughs> Depends on uh, interpretation, I guess. Uh, that's my get out of uh, uh, awkward position question, leave it to the scholars. But I think that uh, what would also be established is the rights of Christians and Jews to practice their faith. Yeah, you know, that's, exa <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what would be uh, 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 brought about. So yeah, if you're a religious Christian in this country and you care about your faith and your rights to practice your faith yeah. uh, and your free speech to, to defend your rights to faith, then you've got to back Islam now. I, I Islam think is on a general home. point, I think that um, the, the, the real enemy of both Muslims, Christians, Jews, or religious people are actually secularists yeah. because they don't believe in religion yeah. and they want to relegate religion to nothing. Yeah. And their ultimate goal is to defeat religion and they would love religion to not even be around. So um, yeah, exactly. I mean, Christians and Jews and Muslims should be actually allies. Unfortunately, the secularists have succeeded in pitting themselves uh, you know, uh, ourselves mm. against each other, yeah. when in reality we should be allying against the, the atheists and the secularists. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, atheism is on the rise uh, under this current secular liberal society yeah. that we live in. So it's, it's anti-religion, you know. I mean, cr the Christians talk about the end times as well and how people will turn away from religion in the end times. Well, it's happening in the West. You yeah. know, the West Can I just say one thing? Uh, it was something I said before we came on air, and that is that Look, I know that there are some, you know, Christian nationalists who are actually scared that Muslims are going to take over this country. Um, 
And I think it's exaggerated. I mean, we, we, we laugh about it. We play it up because we're Muslims and we're like, yes, you know, the, <laughs> all the pubs are going to be mosques and the churches are going to be mosques. But in, in reality, we're a minority in this country. We're a growing yeah. minority and we, we're, we're a weak minority. And that's going to be the case for the foreseeable future. Um, but I tell you what, if a deal was on the table, this is controversial, but if a deal was on the table to limit Islam in the country, as long as the West stayed out of Muslim nations, didn't invade them, didn't seek to impose their values on them, um, I would take that deal. I would, I would actually say that, okay, fine. I myself would limit my activity in this country, or I would make it drip, one of the two. But if I was here and that deal was on the table, you leave Muslim countries alone to develop naturally uh, and Islamically. You don't invade them. You don't for force your you know, LGBT doctrine and all this Western Coca-Cola and McDonald's, whatever. Uh, and in return, we limit our activities here in the West, I would take that deal, would you? Probably, yeah, I think I would. I mean, basically, you know, I think it's actually said in Islam that not everyone will embrace the religion. The majority know? won't. The majority won't, you know, so it's actually in our belief system to yeah. understand that concept. Obviously, we want everyone to embrace Islam, and it's only natural, I mean, any religion would argue that point, that they want, ideally, everyone to embrace their value mm. system because they believe it's the right way of, of life and to live and to worship the creator of the universe. You know, everyone would argue that, and I, I argue that as well. But I understand that there will be people who reject it, there will be people who will never be introduced to it ever, so they will die without ever hearing the message of Islam. That's just the way the dunya has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something we understand, we're not stupid, we're not ignorant, we understand this point. And the idea that Muslims want to take over Britain is a conspiracy, it's just a fake conspiracy. Yeah. It's, there's no conscious effort to do it. The fact, but it's different to the phenomenon of people being drawn to Islam. That's a different yeah. thing. But it doesn't mean we want to take over by armed revolution. The, all I, of Britain, I would love you know Britain I mean? to become a Muslim so, country, yeah. uh, but, but obviously not by force. You know? I mean, yeah. But let's say you know, if, if, if the majority of the country just decide to become Muslim because they believe in Islam, what's wrong with that? But I guess... Yeah, there's nothing wrong I, with but that. But the reality is that the British secularists, they will never accept that. Yeah. You know, because they, this is our country and we've been yeah, here for yeah. thousands of years. You're not going to take over. And, yeah, but what you mentioned about, okay, if there was some deal in place... To, uh, to, to ditch efforts to push Islam here, but also protect Islam, Islam in uh, I would go Islam, with the bigger picture there. Then yeah, yeah, we would go with the bigger picture, I think, absolutely. Yes. But the problem is the West will never agree to that because they're hell bent on pushing their liberal secular So as long, if that's the case, as long as they can the interfere in our countries, then we can interfere in theirs. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's the deal. That's the deal, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Spiritual leader of five pillars here making a deal. Perhaps you could negotiate. Maybe if Nick Griffin came to power <laughs> in the UK, we could make that deal. <laughs> He would negotiate directly with Dilly, I think. Yeah, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would that would that. They could have like a conference, like uh, you could never one of these, never, uh, it? you know, G8 conference or the G2 <laughs> conference. Dilly and uh, Nick Griffin. Yeah, you can never say never, yeah. never say never. Well, I think uh, those were all of the major news that I was planning on discussing in this episode. Is there anything you wanted to mention before? No, we no, 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 no. Um, yeah, I think our. Any, 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 more, <laughs> any more trips? Uh, <laughs> any more trips? Roshan been planned. Uh, no, um, well, there is uh, one that Dilly might be going on, but we'll keep a sum about that at the moment. It's not confirmed. Yeah, a couple, sense. actually, he might be going on. So I think he is the... Um, oh, you mean like holidays? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hawaii, um, Dubai, Doha. No, I'm not going to Dubai ever again, inshallah. Okay. Uh, I'm boycotting Dubai. That's not even funny. Yeah, yeah, that's not even funny. Uh, no, 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 no holidays uh, planned at all. I mean, I think... Um, why am I talking to you about my holidays? I, well, I, it's none of your business. It's none of the viewers' business. I'm a journalist my trying to call life. out your hypocrisy. I can't help yeah, it. It's just natural. Yeah, yeah. Especially. No, but five pillars. Obviously, we do intend to do some traveling uh, this year. Yeah. Uh, inshallah, you, you've not been on a, a trip for us yet, a foreign trip. Yeah. Inshallah, that will happen um, at some point. We're thinking about France because of the Olympics, which should not be held in Paris because they're so disgraceful in their attitude towards Muslims. So we want to play the spoiler during the Paris Olympics. But that's just around the corner. Um, yeah, Dilly's, Dilly's got a few trips planned to more exotic destinations on behalf of Five Pillars, but we'll, we'll keep some on that for the moment. Um, but I think I'll give, I might give the priority to you guys over me because I've done a few kind of spectacular trips, world groundbreaking historic trips uh, to different places. Uh, 
<laughs> Islamic Emirates. So for maybe example, yeah. maybe it's your turn now and Dilly's turn. Well, maybe that's a good question to end the show on. Uh, where would you want to see Robert Carter reporting from? Give your uh, questions, uh, give your options in the comments section below, and uh, we'll check them out as we always do. But uh, for now, I think we'll end the show. We've discussed a lot, and of course, breaking news could happen at any point as we anticipate a potential uh, attack by Israel possibly directly on Iran. So uh, do stay tuned as we'll be bringing you all of the breaking news as it's happening on Five Pillars. Uh, do please like, share and subscribe. It helps the channel immensely. And until next time, inshallah, we will catch you again, hopefully in, uh, in better times, but uh, maybe not. So, salamu alaikum for now. God bless. Salamu alaikum. <laughs>